Good morning and welcome to Brighton Road Baptist Church here this morning. Whether you are a regular attender here at Brighton Road or whether you've just stumbled upon us online, you are really welcome. I'm Marion Richardson, one of the deacons here, and uh, throughout the service, a number of people will be taking part that are members of our congregation here. And uh, Tim Carter, our, one of our ministers, will be preaching. This morning's service does include communion, so uh, do make sure that you have the various elements needed for bread and wine so that we can join one another later at the table in reflection and worship. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before God, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So let us worship the great God together, our God who has created all, is above all and cares for all. Come, see the Lord in his breathtaking splendour. Let us worship together.
Let us pray. Lord God, you are our King. You are beyond our comprehension. How is it that you can be creator and we can gaze at the wonders of your world and yet you also care and love each one of us to such an extent that you would humble yourself, that you would walk amongst us and even suffer and die so that we might be saved. Words cannot express fully how amazing you are. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the Almighty, our Saviour and our King, and we praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us continue in our worship as we sing a song that reminds us that though God is above all, he put his love for you and I above all. I've come outside 
to share with you a story, a real story that actually happened. And it involves one of these, or in fact two, because this story is about an argument between my two daughters. We were in a playground and they each had one of these. And, you know, to begin with, it was fine. They were enjoying being on these, having fun. Then it evolved into, and I don't know quite how this happened, it, invo it involved getting into a race. They got faster and faster and they were getting really into it. And I don't know how they determined that this happened, but the race finished and each one claimed that they were first. They decided I was the one that came first. Of course, they said I came first and they had all sorts of reasons. And you ask them to this day and they will still say I came first. Now, I don't understand this argument. This thing doesn't actually go anywhere. So I don't quite understand how they can claim I came first. But it reminds me that in life, we can put all sorts of things first. We can claim and rush after and really race after all sorts of things to be first in our lives. Now, it could be the career, getting that house, getting that great holiday. Get, it could be our family. We can put all sorts of things first in our lives. But the passage that we're looking at today in Matthew 10, it says that whilst those things may be important, they're not to be our ultimate passion. Our ultimate passion must be God. God must come first in our lives. Now, you must think, well, how could it be any other way? In fact, you know, because God put, himself, put, put, put us first. You know, he put us first. He, he loved us so much that he gave us his son to die for us. It's the least that we can do is to put him first in our lives. And you know, it's when we meet other people that don't know God, what we want them to see is God in us so that when they do meet with us, they're meeting with God and they can get to know God so that when they receive us, they receive him. Now, our next song is one that reminds us of the reason why we have any of this and it's because of him and that we need to sometimes just get back to that very basic of putting God first in our lives.
The reading this morning is a challenging one. It's one that makes us take a hard look at the perspective that we are to have if we're going to be followers of Jesus. So, over to you, Terry. The reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 32 to 42. And at this point in the passage, Jesus is in the middle of giving instructions to his disciples. If you tell others that you belong to me, I will tell my Father in heaven that you are my followers. But if you reject me, I will tell my Father in heaven that you don't belong to me. Don't think I came to bring peace to this earth. I came to bring trouble not peace. I came to turn sons against fathers, daughters against mothers, daughters-in-law against mothers-in-law. Your worst enemies will be in your family. If you love your father and mother or your sons and daughters more than me, you are not fit to be my disciples. And unless you are willing to take up your cross and come with me, you are not fit to be my disciples. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you give it up for me, you will surely find it. Anyone who welcomes you, welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, also welcomes the one who sent me. Anyone who welcomes a prophet, just because that person is a prophet, will be given the same reward as a prophet. And anyone who welcomes a good person, just because that person is good, will be given the same reward as a good person. And anyone who gives one of my most humble followers a cup of cool water, just because that person is my follower, will surely be rewarded. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The thing about Jesus is, he puts you on the spot. He did this all the time. He said controversial things that polarised other people's opinions. And we find one such saying in our reading this morning. Whoever receives you, receives me, he said. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. Think about the claim that Jesus is making for himself there. In effect, he's saying, if you welcome and accept me, then you are welcoming and accepting God. And in Luke 10, 16, we find the corollary saying, whoever rejects me, Jesus says, rejects the one who sent me. In other words, you reject Jesus, you reject God. If you close your heart to Jesus, you close your heart to God. How you respond to Jesus is indicative of how you respond to the living God. Now, Jesus isn't staking a claim to be God incarnate here, but he is putting down a marker that he is God's appointed, accredited representative, which is still a pretty extraordinary claim to make, actually. Now, you might be tempted to think that someone who says this kind of thing might have been suffering from schizophrenia. But the people Jesus healed, the people Jesus set free, the people Jesus forgave, they were in no doubt that God's saving power had come to them through Jesus and had turned their lives around. Putting it simply, they found that when they met Jesus, God met them. Now, not everyone welcomed Jesus, of course. Ironically, it was the religious leaders who couldn't accept him. He was too much of an iconoclast for them. Overturning the tables in the temple, ripping up the rule book, bypassing them and their institutions to inject the power of God's kingdom straight into people's hearts. He knew he was deeply unpopular with the authorities. That's why he warned his followers that everyone would hate them on his account. But he also said that whenever they spoke up to defend themselves, the spirit of his father would tell them what to say. They wouldn't be by themselves. You see, Jesus didn't just make massive claims on his own account. He says to his disciples, whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. So he's saying that there is a direct correlation between the way people treat you, the way people treat Jesus, and the way they treat God. If people welcome you, then they're welcoming Jesus. And if they're welcoming Jesus, they're welcoming God. If they reject you, then they're rejecting Jesus, and that means they're rejecting God as well. Jesus actually said that Sodom and Gomorrah would get off lightly compared to them. Again, what an extraordinary thing to say. Jesus spoke these words to the twelve apostles just before he sent them out on their mission trip. They went as his representatives and their task was to proclaim the kingdom of God. Wherever they went, the kingdom of God came near to those people and that place through them. And Jesus, he really threw his disciples in the deep end because he sent them out with no resources of their own. No money, no spare clothes, nothing. That meant if they wanted a meal, if they wanted somewhere to sleep for the night, they were entirely dependent upon other people's kindness and hospitality. They had no choice but to knock on people's doors and make contact. But get this, where people made them welcome, where people received them into their homes, they found themselves accepting Jesus and God and the life-changing power of the kingdom into their lives as well. When people met the followers of Jesus and made them welcome, they found that God met them and made them welcome in his kingdom. And, and do you know what's on God's heart for Horsham, for, for the people living in, the ro in your road, the people around you? He wants so to fill you with his spirit and with his presence. 
that when people meet you, they encounter God in you and God through you. Now, it may be they don't actually want that, so they're quite happy to keep you at arm's length. Even without the coronavirus, anything less than two metres, and they start to feel really uncomfortable. And although God wants to bless them through you, some people just aren't interested, thank you very much. But others, others will be open to God. And your prayer for them should be, Lord, how do you want to touch this person's life through me? Jesus wants you to be his ambassador. And the definitive definition of the role of an ambassador was thrashed out at the Congress of Vienna in 1815. It was an international convention called to bring peace to Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. That Congress determined that ambassadors represented the person and dignity of their sovereign and were entitled to personal access to the sovereign to whom they were accredited. I think that's an excellent description of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In your day-to-day living, in all your engagements with other people, you represent Jesus to them. People who haven't got a Bible, people who've never set foot inside a church, they encounter Jesus, they encounter God's kingdom when they meet you. And if that all feels a bit daunting, then think of how those first disciples must have felt when Jesus sent them out with no resources of their own to rely on at all. Perhaps it was only because they were put in a situation where they couldn't be self-sufficient that God was able to use them in the way that he did. So, you, you are Christ's ambassador. You represent the person of your sovereign your Lord, to everyone you meet. That's your privilege. That's your responsibility to him. And and what was the other thing about ambassadors? They were granted personal access to their sovereign. Well, that goes for you too. When you pray, you are given personal access to the King of Kings. That's quite a thought as well. So on that note, Ed, can I ask you to lead us in prayer? Let us pray. Lord, with the lockdown being eased, I pray for common sense and that people are sensible in their actions to remember that there is still social distancing that needs to be adhered to and that while they may be safe they could still harm someone else and that we're doing this for all of the us and not just for ourselves and we remember those who have lost family members whether it's friends family uh, and just pray that you are with them with the friends and family to bring them peace in this difficult time of mourning Uh, pray for the black lives matter situation around the world um just that we can continue to see progress being made towards a better a better world where people can feel safe in their own skin. Um, I pray for the police that that the police can members among the police who might want to harm people can see the errors of their ways and realize and remember that they're here to protect the people, not make the people feel scared. Um, And just in these protests, just keep them peaceful um, and keep them productive and full of love rather than hate. Um, I pray for the situation in Yemen, uh, this humanitarian crisis. There are so many people who need so much help. um, And I just pray that your hand can move and as as the world can can come to their aid. And in all of these things, I pray for the political leaders of countries around the world, that the decisions they make, um, whether it's to do with the coronavirus, that they're they're for the good of the people, not for the good of money. Um, And with the Black Lives Matter protests, that the decisions are made that keep people safe and work towards uh, just a better world and freedom. And in Yemen, 
this situation is it seems to be largely ignored and I just pray that it gets the attention it needs because there are millions and millions of people who need help. Um, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. So as we draw together at the communion table, we continue our worship as we sing, Behold the Lamb who takes our sin away.
So now I invite you, come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you were wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and died on Calvary's cruel cross to pay the redemptive price for our sins. As we come to this communion table today, we kneel before you in grateful remembrance of what you did for us at Calvary, with hearts full of humble thanksgiving. And Lord God, we are sorry that all too frequently we forget to credit you with all you have done in our lives. We forget to put you first in our lives. We're sorry that we neglect our relationship with you and let you down by not being the salt and light you call us to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came so that your body may be broken and your blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And thank you that we can hold on to your promise of life eternal with you. Amen. And so, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and offered it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we eat together. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you. And so together we drink. Let's continue in prayer. Lord Jesus, what a privilege to be able to come before your throne of grace and take of these precious elements of bread and wine in remembrance of you. May we never forget the enormous price that was paid on our behalf. May we never forget that we have been bought with a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we live for you from this day on, knowing that your body was broken and your blood was spilt for us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, let us go out into this week looking to Christ as our example so that others might see by what we do and how we do it what transforming power it is to know Jesus Christ. 
Our closing hymn is I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. Go now in the righteousness of faith and live by God's just demands. Let nothing claim your devotion above the Lord and count nothing of value above knowing Christ. Press on towards the ultimate prize of being one with him. And may God's perfect word revive your soul. May Christ Jesus be your saviour and your rock. And may the Holy Spirit strengthen you to press ever onward. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated. Lord, to Thee, take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let Sweet.
swift and beautiful for thee. be mm-hmm. 